Okay, so this part of our meeting is basically just answering some of your questions from this unit on skepticism. So a couple of people asked, how do you pronounce Descartes? So it's pronounced like Descartes, not Descartes, <laughs> which yeah, it is a little bit weird. Uh, another thing to note is that Cartesian means having to do with Descartes. Uh, why? Well, that is that is beyond human knowledge. Um, no, I don't know. It's just the, the way that it's pronounced. So I know, especially in an online class, when you uh, are more doing more reading and typing than you are hearing, it can be helpful to know how to pronounce things. And maybe just in case it's helpful really briefly, the, the Descartes argument kind of went like this. Descartes started with the method of doubt. What all can you doubt? And then, uh, I think, if you guys are, can you guys mute yourselves? They all have their own. They heard of it in geometry. Sorry, I think there's people that are talking. Uh, thank you. Okay, cool. Appreciate that. Okay, so Descartes starts with the method of doubt, basically saying, how much can you doubt? Let's doubt everything we can doubt. Let's give up all the beliefs that we can give up. Then Descartes uh, goes from that to, you know, well, you know, I can doubt that like abortion is wrong or I can doubt these controversial topics, but can I doubt that there's a table in front of me? And Descartes says, well, yes, I can, because what if I'm dreaming? What if I'm in the matrix or a brain in the vat? So I can doubt these, my, my everyday sense perceptions. Those are, those are doubtable. Well, what about things like one plus one equals two or a square has four sides? Can I doubt those things? And Descartes says, yes, because what if there's an evil demon or an evil genius deceiving me about math and logic? And from that, Descartes gets to the cogito, which is famously, you, might, you probably have heard this before this class, I think, therefore I am. And Descartes says, look, I think. I am a thinking thing. Um, and in order to be a thinking thing, there has to be a, someone or something doing the thinking. So I can know because I'm thinking that I exist. Um, and then Descartes tries to you know, take this cogito and then build up human, human knowledge from that. And Descartes uses God and he says, look, I have this idea of God. This amazing idea of God couldn't come from anything except God, um, but God wouldn't radically deceive us. And so that's basically Descartes uh, how Descartes gets to skepticism through the, the dreaming and the evil genius argument. And then bottom rock for Descartes is this cogito, which then Descartes uses to build up, uh, build up the rest of his knowledge. Okay, that's a little bit of a review of Descartes. Let's move on. Okay, some people were saying, why are we even talking about skepticism? Like, what's the point of this? This has no implications for my life. It's totally impractical. Okay, here's a couple reasons why I think this is important. The first has to do with epistemic humility. Epistemic humility means being open-minded and realizing like we don't know everything and we need to really think about what we believe. Like, do we have good reasons to believe these things? And I think when we challenge the scope of our knowledge and realize we might know a lot less than we think we know, this encourages us to be open-minded and to look for new evidence, even on things that are much more questionable, like our, our social, moral, political beliefs. Um, you know, do you believe eating meat is wrong? Or do you believe this political party is better than this political party? I think skepticism helps us be a little bit more open-minded and not be so confident on maybe these beliefs that, that we grew up with our whole lives. So it kind of helps us think about why do I believe what I believe and do I have good reasons for that? Um, I also think it's just, it's fun. It's fun to think about knowledge and the scope of our knowledge. I don't think that studying philosophy only is valuable as the means to something else. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to learn, you know, how to wire this electrical box so then I can like become an electrician or fix the electricity in my own house or something. I think doing philosophy can be similar to like reading poetry or listening to music. It's something that's valuable to do in and of itself. It doesn't have to be only valuable for the sake of something else. You might say you're not convinced by this. And I will say this, we're gonna get into much more practical epistemology in the next two units. Um, and our next two units will pretty much be assuming that global skepticism is false, that we can know or rationally believe at least some things. So when I've taught this class before, it's kind of funny because a lot of people love skepticism and it's their favorite unit. 
And then there's this other group that is really not into skepticism. They think it's kind of pointless. And they're much more into like social, uh, the social and religious epistemology. So if you're not as into skepticism, hang tight. We're starting uh, social epistemology this week and then we'll do religious epistemology. And you might find those a little more practical and interesting. Okay, couple more questions. Why do people find skepticism appealing in the first place? Some people were asking about this. So one reason is I think there's a lot of everyday things that we take for granted. Um, and, and that doesn't just mean these controversial topics we take for granted that uh, the world around us exists roughly as it is. We take for granted the truths of math and logic. We take a lot of stuff for granted. And I think skepticism kind of interestingly shows that we can bring these things into doubt. There's this real possibility that almost everything we believe is false. Um, and I don't know about you guys, when I first learned about this, this really, really bothered me. Um, I actually lost quite a bit of sleep over it. It really, really bothered me that I couldn't know these basic things that I had taken for granted for so long. I can't prove I'm not a brain in a bat. That, that's, that's kind of a crazy thought. Um, and if this doubting takes away knowledge, the fact that we can doubt almost everything we believe, then we can't know those things either. So... I think that's that's kind of why people find skepticism appealing because it really uh, it challenges. It, there's this possibility that almost everything we believe is false, and then a lot of people intuitively think that that takes away our knowledge. Um, in the responses to skepticism, we'll see like not everyone buys this, but I think this is the basic idea of why people find it appealing. Okay. A lot of you guys had questions about Moore's response and sort of what's up with this response to skepticism. This is so weird. Um, so let me say a little bit about that, but you should feel free to, you know, ask additional questions about it if this doesn't clarify. So reminder, what Moore says is, look, I have a hand. I have a hand. I know I have a hand. So I know that external objects exist. So the skeptic is wrong. <laughs> um, it's almost just funny because you're just like, wow, like part of me is like, what? And then part of me is like, it's so, it's so obvious. You have a hand. Come on, guys. It's common sense. Um, so first thing to say, the fact that Moore talks about hands, that doesn't matter for the argument. You could replace hands with feet. You could replace it with elbows. You could replace it with, here's a table. You know, you could replace it with any regular size object that you can clearly perceive. So don't get hung up on the hands part. That's not essential to Moore's argument. The second thing that you might find interesting is that Moore's objection made this, this thing in philosophy popular, what's called a Moorean shift. And so when someone gives an argument for a very implausible conclusion, some people say, look, the conclusion of your argument is so clearly false that one of your premises has to be false, even if I can't tell you which premise. So I don't accept your argument. So this is called a Moorean shift because you're not saying, this premise is false. You're just saying that conclusion can't be right. It defies common sense. And some people thought that Moore is one of the people that brought back in this common sense philosophy, common sense epistemology. In epistemology and philosophy, we can't lose sight of common sense. Okay, third thing to say is that Moore's goal isn't necessarily to convince a skeptic. So Moore isn't necessarily thinking, look, all the skeptics are now going to think we have tons of knowledge because of my, my proof of the external world. But instead, Moore wants to help the non-skeptic see, here's a good way to resist the skeptic's argument. And again, don't let the skeptic pull you away from common sense. Here's a hand. Come on, guys. That's common sense. Okay. There's a little bit about Moore's response. Okay. What's the difference between skepticism and then this other thing some of you might have heard of called solipsism? Okay, what is the difference between these? Solipsism, remember we talked about global skepticism, kind of skepticism that challenges almost all or all of our knowledge versus local skepticism, which challenges some sphere of our knowledge. And solipsism is a kind of local skepticism basically says we cannot know if other minds exist. So I cannot prove my friends and family exist. But solipsism doesn't talk about you know other things we may or may not know. It's just about other minds. So the only person I can really know that exists is me. That's solipsism. Again, local skepticism. Whereas 
skepticism in general, especially academic skepticism, normally refer refers to global skepticism, this view that we cannot know anything, or at least we can we can doubt almost everything. So it's not just about other minds, but about whether, you know, there's a table here, whether there's an external world, at least as we perceive it, whether two plus two equals four. So global skepticism is more extreme than just solipsism. Um, most glo global skeptics would be solipsists. They would say we also can't know that other minds exist, but also they would say that we should doubt a ton of other things as well. Okay. Okay, here's some people were interested in the pragmatic response to skepticism, which Susanna Reinard, whose picture is right there, she's uh, one of the big people that makes this response. And some are saying, well, we're talking about knowledge. How could this pragmatic response give us knowledge? And here's the basic idea of the pragmatic response, just to remind you, the idea is, look, we have a lot to gain by believing in the outside world if it's real. Um, if our family and friends really do exist, if our life really is roughly as we perceive it, then we have a lot to gain by, by believing in it and just kind of living our lives as we would if it was real. But if we're brains and mats, then we don't really have that much to lose by believing uh, in the outside world. We might have a couple false beliefs, but like you're a brain and a mat, you know, it, it doesn't really matter anyway. So based on this cost benefit analysis, it makes a lot more sense to believe in the outside world than to not. Um, and remember from the last unit, when we talked about knowledge, it's justified, true, ungettiered belief, right? So here's what I think this response does. I think this pragmatic response to skepticism gives us a level of justification. It gives us a good reason to believe in the external world, but I don't know that it gives us knowledge. I think it's very hard to see how it could give us justified, true, ungettiered belief, but I think at the very least it can give us some justification or reason to believe in the external world. Okay. Okay. I think there's two more questions and then we will um, move into the next part of our meeting today. So what is the difference between skepticism and the simulation argument? So arguments for skepticism, think about like Descartes, but others as well, they often utilize what's called the method of doubt. We talked about this already, which is basically doubt everything you can, question everything and see what's left. So remember, we have for Descartes, it's the method of doubt, the dreaming argument, the evil demon, and then Descartes, that, that all this doubting leads Descartes to the cogito. I think, therefore I am. You're, you're trying to doubt everything. Bostrom, on the other hand, makes what's called the simulation argument. This assumes our world is largely the way that we perceive it. Um, and at least assumes, you know, the scientific method is a good one. These advances in technology are real. And based on this, um, Bostrom concludes that one of three propositions are true. Um, either the human species is very likely to go extinct before reaching a technologically mature stage. That's what's known as the doom hypothesis. So we're not going to get to the stage in technology where we can easily run these simulations of our ancestors. Two, any post-human civilization that reaches this technologically mature stage is extremely unlikely to run an ancestor simulations. And even if most of them don't wanna run ancestor simulations, even if some of them do, uh, a small number of them do, this argument could still go through. Um, and so then three is that we are almost certainly living in a computer simulation. So if you think that the human species is likely to reach a technologically mature stage, and some of these post-human civilizations are gonna run ancestor simulations, then that means it's very likely we're living in a computer simulation. So that's the simulation argument, just as a review. While these arguments are similar, um, the, because, so they are similar because they conclude like, Reality is different than it seems at first blush. If the simulation argument is right, it is very likely that the things you perceive and even the people in your life are computer simulations. Um, whoops, sorry. So, so again, Bostrom is not using the method of doubt. Bostrom's not saying let's doubt everything we can. Bostrom's saying based on these advances in technology, Reality is different than it seems at first blush. We're likely living in a computer simulation. Descartes also thinks reality is 
potentially very different than it seems at first blush, but Descartes and other skeptics do that using the method of doubt. So hopefully that's kind of clear what the difference between those are, but also what the similarities are. Okay, last thing before we end is what are some responses to Bostrom's simulation argument? Um, so one response is saying we could never create consciousness with technology. Consciousness requires something beyond, you know, whatever we're doing when we're creating computers and then uh, going beyond computers. So I don't know if you've seen Westworld. Westworld is kind of about this. Uh, it's a really good show. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. But it's kind of challenging this idea, like, could we ever make robots that are truly conscious and truly have free will? But if you think no, that technology couldn't create consciousness, then that's one way you can respond to the simulation argument. And that's kind of saying we'll never reach technological maturity is another way of putting that. Um, you could also you know, deny one of those two propositions Bostrom talks about. You could say the doom hypothesis is true and, and we're just not gonna reach that level of technological maturity. Or you could say none of these societies that reach that level of technological maturity would be interested in running ancestor simulations. Um, another interesting idea, what about giving maybe a Morian response to the simulation argument? Maybe the fact that we're not living in a computer simulation is more plausible than Bostrom's premises. Uh, I don't know if that's plausible or not, but that's maybe something we could talk about in discussion. Okay, that is the end. So I'm going to stop the recording.